Mommy Prescott Adams. And I'm Pat Prescott, and we are listening for Liberation. Today, we are thinking about gathering number two of listening for justice. And it's all about who am I? Because identity matters. And in this gathering, we spend a lot of time literally reflecting on our lived experiences, how we've shown up in the world, how people have treated us, and how all of that impacts who we are today. And we're going to hear all of that from a very special guest today. She is one of the original founding members of the group Hiroshima. She is a Japanese-American, internationally known Koto player. And it is our pleasure to present to you June Kuramoto. So June, I am just beyond excited to have a conversation with you about who you are. And we are doing this as a segment of something we call listening for justice. One day I just woke up and said, you know what? I think adults and young people could come together even in a virtual space and learn to understand racism and other systems of oppression and then talk to each other yes. about their lived experiences in a safe space. And I say safe, you know, everybody wants to say brave. And I'm like, yeah, guess what? To be brave, you need to feel safe. Yes. And so we have expert facilitators who move into small groups of six to 10 people and engage after I present some content. And other guides as well will be presenting this content. And so our very second gathering is called, Who Am I? Because identity matters. And Pat asked me to share with you who I am and how I show up in the world, because we want to hear that from you as well. And I told them, you know what? I show up as a mother always, and as someone who is so proud to be African. And I find any way I can. I changed my name in college, right? <laughs> All my children have African names. If you see my house, you understand. Because I knew I had this opportunity to use Sankofa, you know, go back and fetch my culture. Yes, taken from me once and never again. And that's how I show up in the world. And listening for justice became that way that I could just offer people an opportunity to dig into who they are and not think the work is outward. And I know you know what I mean by that. So I'm so excited to hear more about your lived experience and the fact that you're down the street from my sister right now. What? <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep, no. Well, this is well, her I, old stomping grounds right that's here. That's right, right. And I was so privileged to grow up actually at you can hear the sirens <laughs> the, uh, on La Brea and Adams. I was born in Japan, but came to America when I was about six. And, and when people immigrated from Japan to uh, America was usually to the, uh, through San Francisco port and then the train to Union Station, right? And so then most, most of us immigrated to the East LA which is right now more, more Hispanic. Whereas back in then it was uh, half Jewish, half Hispanic. But my mother coming to America with four kids alone, not speaking English from two years to seven, we got kicked out of many apartments because we made too much noise. <laughs> so my uncle was good enough to find a house here in, on the West side. So we grew up on the West side. And I was very fortunate to, to, to grow up there because it was a third Japanese American, third blacks and third white or actually Jewish. So I had a great multicultural experience. And what I found was uh, that made me appreciate people, people of color, people of different because uh, they, they taught me a lot about accepting myself for who I am as a, as a Japanese descent, right? And so with that, 
I was just so, uh, but I, at the same time, I was homesick for Japan. So I found this instrument that that linked me to that culture. But as I grew up in the, you know, as I started growing up, I wanted, I didn't like the Japanese music. I wanted, I wanted um, Smokey Robinson and I wanted Marvin Gaye and I wanted the spinners and the temptations. That's what I grew, you know, that's what I wanted. So then I thought, how could I, um, I didn't think I would be the person, but introduce this instrument into this musical genre that I love so much. And that was my journey. And to, to cut to this chase, um, as, we, as the band formed, I was so lucky because the jazz people, all the jazz greats embraced us and understood us because they also, everyone, especially the African-American community, because they understood my need to search for my root mm -hmm. and to appreciate it, to embrace it, and to embellish it. And so they were totally supportive of this. And on Crenshaw uh, near Lamort Park was a Brockman Gallery, two brothers, and they got the band on a CETA program before we ever had a record deal. So we got to travel in the community and play, you know, at the high schools or, you know, community centers. And uh, we even, we played Watts Towers, of course, you know, the festivals. And, and again, we've never had greater support than from the African-American community because they related to what we were trying to do. They understood us and we appreciated and and we understood what their search was. So it made us one. It was, it was, it's been that beautiful. And to this day, we are still popular in DC, in Atlanta, you know. Yes, we are, we are, we've been very fortunate. Could you talk about Hiroshima, the name? Like, sure. Yes, of course. You know, and again, here, here we are in this day of age where there's so much hate, as they say. We are now encountering Asian hate. Not that we've never encountered it. You know, it's very more blatant now, unfortunately. And but the, the, the Japanese Americans were always put were put in camps in 19 in the 1940s when the war broke out with Japan, even though they were American citizens. They were still put in camps while. My uncle, who was born and raised in LA, was put in, uh, uh, was, uh, uh, which, excuse me, he enlisted and fought in the World War II and saved the Texas Battalion. It cost his life. But anyways, the speaking of Asian hate, uh, the, the, we also had negative stereotypic image of ourselves, whether it was, uh, you know, the Ching Chong Chinaman, the slanted eyes, the coolie hats, and stuff like that, and and we had a discussion in the early late 60s, 70s, you know, at which time the Hispanics had a great movement of Santana, Malo, you know, they were coming up, and we're thinking, and 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 the the blacks had their own, always had their own music because of the jazz, of course, New Orleans, right, but. The Asians did not, and, and so the two brothers, Dan and John, were tripping out saying, gee, wouldn't it be great if there was an Asian band that broke the stereotypic image, you know, and that, um, you know, wouldn't it be great and it made a statement and, and, you know, and at that time there were also groups like Chicago, Arc you know, Alabama, you right. Know, right, so they thought, well, how about Hiroshima? <laughs> you know, and that's how it came. And they thought it's strong, powerful. It it touches nerves, but controversy is good. Make you look at it, deal with it, deal with it, but not in a negative way. We thought that if the city itself has been devastated, and now it is a blooming one of the most thriving cities. This is the Phoenix 
from the ashes. Mm -hmm. And this is what we wanted to, to, to spread, that we are children of the atomic age, but it's not what was done now, it's what we do with it now. I mean, what was done then, it's what we do with it now and turn the negatives into a positive. And then, of course, many people said, oh, don't use that name. Record companies asked us to change names. But we stuck true to it. And we said that if you listen to our music, then you will understand. And many, not all, agreed, said yes. When they listened to the music, then they understood. People have been saying yes to the music of Hiroshima for forever, June, because how could you say no? It just, it says so much and connects people in so many ways. And you talk about embracing that instrument, the koto, such an important part of Japanese culture. What are you most proud of about being of Japanese descent? And what about your culture do you most want other people to know? I, well, my culture, I, I have to say, it was like the uh, tsunami. Remember the earthquake tsunami incident? They proved themselves as civilized people. And, and, and that they waited in line. They, I, you know, I heard stories where, you know, they go in line and they grab their things that they need, but when the store closed, they put it back and then came back the next day to get you know, that I learned thoughtfulness. And, and, and you have to, uh, my daughter made a very great observation when we were in Japan. She said, in general, she says, Japanese people are thoughtful because you live in a country that's so small with so many people, you have to be thoughtful of everyone else or you will not get along. It's just like when, you, when you're driving in the car, if you're the front car and you stop at a signal, all the cars behind you turn off their lights so that it doesn't glare in the front, the car in front of you. But the, the front car can keep the lights on so that you know there's cars in that lane. But th that's how you know thoughtful they are because to live in such a small space, you have to be that thoughtful. And that's like, you know, large families. You know, we tend to tolerate, learn to share to, you know, more than if you were living by yourself. Because if you're living by yourself, you can take a bath anytime you want. You know, you can, you can watch TV, whatever you want. Whereas if you live in a larger community, you have to share, we had to share one bathroom with the six of us. You know, we had to wait our turns. And my mother being poor, we had to share the bath water you know, all those things. And, and, and those things, you know, I, I really appreciate, you know, and learned and I hope I've adapted it to my lifestyle and being less selfish, mm -hmm. just like my mother. Yeah, and yeah. So those kinds of things I really um, respected and, and treasure in, you know, of the Japanese. They taught me how to be thoughtful, hopefully. Yeah. You know, June, I'm, I'm connecting to uh, an African proverb and a word Ubuntu that means I am because we are. And it is really this idea of communal living that in our American experience, we, we get the opposite often, right? You know, who's your competitor? Only right. one person can win, right? right. <laughs> and I so appreciate hearing you even be able to like see that and and commit to bringing that value to your family is it ever hard oh yeah <laughs> oh yeah and, you know because america makes it everything's you know and especially now everything's become so dis so disposable and accessible right so we're being less patient but technology has made everyone more impatient needing everything now you know everything is accessible and everything is disposable right i mean it's like the printers you know they make the printers cheaper but the cartridge costs you know a million dollars 
and you have to have the cartridge to make the printer run, you know, all these things. I mean, you know, so that's what we're dealing with. That's what the kids are dealing with, you know, and that makes it hard to teach them patience, to teach value, right? You know, and, and, and thoughtfulness is coming more into capitalist rather than consideration thoughtful of how do you think of making more money how to get how to sell more right everything is marketing everything is yeah so it's a whole different world but um but i was also saying how i was getting together with uh the musicians yesterday dave cause <laughs> kirk whalem and and a, a song came to mind was it was uh, the title came, uh, it was either, if it's me, it must be you, or if it's you, it must be me. Meaning that, again, going back to this state of hate crimes and everything, I hope I'm a more sensitive person to all of my brothers and sisters of all colors, because especially having the fortune of going where I did, going up where I did, but, you know, if things are happening to like George Man and Brianna Taylor and all that, I'm ignorant to think it's not going to happen to me or things happen to me. I'm not ignorant that it's not going to happen to another person of color. Do you know, it, we are all, this is all, we all have to be in it together. It is all us. It is all of us, you know, and, 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 and I am no better. You are no better. They are no better, you know, and this is, this is my sadness is that we've come to so much, you know, divide. Wow, Pat, I'm so glad you invited June to talk to us about who am I? Yeah, she, I knew that she would be perfect. One of my uh, greatest experiences with, with, was with June and also Dan Kuramoto, who's her former husband, still best friends and still working in the band together. And my good friend Keiko Matsui, who is uh, Japanese born as well, and she is a pianist. I did an interview with them about Asian American culture. And afterwards, they all came over to my house and we <laughs> ate, we broke bread together. And I think that that is, this is a thing that we can do together, a way of sharing not only our cultures, but really engaging as friends. You know, you think about, have I sat down in your home to break bread with you? Yes. That's an important thing. Yes, thank you. Uh, can you invite me next time? <laughs> yes, only if you promise that you'll make your mac and cheese. Okay, I will make my mac and cheese. <laughs> and I'll fry the chicken. <laughs> Yay. And I can't wait to see what June brings. <laughs> yes, it's going to be delicious. I can tell you that. Thank you for joining us, uh, listening for liberation. There'll be more to come.